from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Larry Applebaum from the Music Division here at the Library of Congress. It's my pleasure to say sitting to my left is musician, scholar, and educator Ingrid Monson. Some of you will know that Ingrid is Quincy Jones Professor of African American Music at Harvard University. She has served as Interim Dean of Arts and Humanities at Harvard and Chair of the Department of Music. Ms. Monson is an award-winning author. Her books include Freedom Sounds, Civil Rights Call Out to Jazz and Africa, and Saying Something, Jazz Improvisation and Interaction. Both books belong on the shelf of any serious student or scholar of jazz. I'm pleased that she's with us. She's here uh, sort of under the auspices of a jazz scholar program, part of the Library of Congress's effort with the Riva and David Logan Foundation. I hope you will help me welcome Ingrid Monson. <laughs> nice to see you again, as always. Uh, nice to see you. Yes. I, I, I first want to say that I, I was just delighted to be invited to come to the Library of Congress and be here for two weeks in residence. I've, I've wanted to come and work on the Max Roach papers for quite some time, and you just made it easy. You're on sabbatical yes. right now, so yeah. nice timing. Perfect. Yes. Um, so you arrived earlier this week, and I know you wanted to look at Max Roach. Is there something in particular you're hoping to find, and what are you discovering so far? Um, well, I'm very interested in this collection, partly because I wrote a great deal about Max Roach in Freedom Sounds. Um, I interviewed him for it. I interviewed Abby Lincoln and, and a number of related people, and I went through the documents that were available to me then. But his archive was not available then. So one of the key things I want to look at is what's in the archive that can enrich the story I've already told or correct the story I've already told. Um, and so the first box I got out on Monday were uh, the scores to the Freedom Now suite. Um, you know, and the care with which these scores are put together is really interesting. And every part of the suite has a score. Um, and they're very detailed, e including drum parts and things for triptych, which is the, um, um, the middle movement. Um, and then I learned that there was originally an overture written for it that uh, I've never heard. And uh, it's there in the box. Uh, and that there were some other songs that were being uh, you know, considered between he and Oscar Brown, and there are some scores for that material as well. So already I have an expanded sense of what the, um, you know, their process of trying things out. Um, there's also a lot of correspondence that relates to um, Freedom Sounds, and it also relates to something else that I wrote in my, uh, about in my book, Freedom Sounds, which was about this Ira Gittler's review of Abby Lincoln Straight Ahead in 1961, which just, shall we say, uh, stirred controversy. Stirred, stirred con controversy is to put it lightly. And there was this huge debate about racial prejudice in jazz in the 19, early, in early 1962 in Downbeat, in which, which they had a panel discussion and some very uncensored things were said. What I found in the correspondence just in the last couple of days is that at the time that Ira Gittler's review came out, which was, would have been in, sometime in November of 1961, they contacted a lawyer. Hmm. Um, and there's a handwritten thing of Abby responding to uh, Ira Gittler 
Uh, Who contacted the lawyer? Was it Abby and Max, or was it? I think Abby and Max. I, I, I haven't figured out exactly the chain, but there were two attorneys. Hmm. Um, and a very stern letter was sent by an attorney to Ira Gittler um, in November of 1961. So this, uh, is, so, the availability of materials like this just in, enriches what you're, what you're able to see and what you're able to know um, about this amazing career that Max Roach had. Can, since you're talking about um, the Freedom Now Suite, can you talk a little bit about the context of what that work meant for the time in which it was created? It was an extraordinarily important uh, work. He and Oscar Brown began to work on it in 1958 or 1959. Now, Sonny Rollins had did, done something he called a Freedom Suite in 1957, that was, but that was a completely instrumental work. Uh, but he worked with Oscar Brown. Clearly, Max had this vision for this multi-movement piece. I mean, I think it's often forgotten that Max Roach was a composer. And so he had this vision for a multi-movement uh, piece. He wanted lyrics. He, he had Oscar Brown write lyrics. Um, he wanted Abby Lincoln to sing. He got in touch with Babatunde Olatunji. He wanted to do something that included Africa. And evidently, one of the debates between Oscar Brown and Max Roach had to do with, did, did Africa come first in the suite, or did Africa come at the end. And those of you uh, who know the work know that it comes at the end in Tears for Johannesburg and All Africa. And it speaks to independence. Um, and right at, when this was being composed is when a lot of African nations gained in independence, 16 of them in 1960. And African diplomats be, began to be in New York. And guess what? They went out and heard jazz and got to know people within the community. Um, so Max took it from being a story of Africa to the United States to, uh, to a story that was really the United States to look at contemporary Africa in a, in a pan-African kind of sense. He, he, they were able to do it as a statement. I also uh, interviewed Nat Hentoff about this. And the reason it was recorded is because this was the year that uh, uh, Nat Hentoff ran Candid Records. And he could really pretty much put out what he wanted. It was an independent label. Uh, and he wanted Max to be able to say what he, you know, his piece. And he knew that, that Max Roach was you know, politically engaged, and the lyrics refer to A. Philip Randolph, and um, so they made a statement with it. And the cover, if you've never seen it, um, has, a pi has a picture uh, like a lunch counter sit-in. So the lunch counter sit-ins happened as this year. So a lot was going on in the world when this came out. Uh, the first live performance was a benefit for the Congress of Racial Equality in early 1961. Um, and, of course, it immediately caught the attention of the jazz world, uh, that people were standing up and saying something. That this, and Nat Hentoff described um, the time as that you just, had to, you, you just had to stand up and say something. You, had, you weren't content to just sit in your seat. Um, and, um, what was the response at the time to this work? Well, the response, as I remember, there were, there, were, there were some people, Dan Morgenstern wrote a really nice review of it and liked it. And it included dancers in the, in the original program. And I guess Maya Angelou was one of the, one of the dancers. In some other um, publications, it was dismissed as, oh, this is some you know, new age cool thing that people in New York maybe like, but nobody else does. You know, so that it was you know too highbrow and it was too gloomy and was not optimistic. Or enough. in a generational sense, many older critics might have said, "Hey, musicians should play music; they shouldn't be making political statements." Well, right, and that was certainly one attitude about that. To ma to ha make a political statement was, in some corners, considered to you know be beneath art. 
but overall, I, you know, I think in jazz, people always felt com compelled in, in this time period that, that they had to prove that jazz was art. Um, this generation of musicians really fought that battle from bebop into the 1960s. We now take it for granted that it's an art music, but it wasn't considered that then. And so there was an ambitiousness to you know, create a larger work to show that this isn't, um, you know, that, 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 that there's a, there's a, we have a larger creative vision and we're going to do it. And the thing that got talked about most in the reviews of the piece was the, move, the subset of triptych called Protest, where Abby Lincoln does a kind of stylized screaming over drum accompaniment. And I looked at all the reviews of it, and none of the rest of the pieces really talked about. All they, all they did was focus on the screams, as if um, that were not musically contextualized in an extremely rich way. So what have you found so far about um, Max's vision for the work and how it might have changed through performance? I haven't, I haven't addressed that question. I want to I wanna, um, listen to this recording you told me about that they evidently performed it in Iran. Yeah. I've got to hear that. Yeah. I've got to take a closer listen to the, you know, German performance. Um, Do, I'm just curious, how many people sitting here have heard this work, the Freedom Now Suite? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it's called We Insist Freedom Now. Well, the full the full name is We Insist Freedom Now Suite. Max Roach's Freedom Now Suite, but among musicians and things, it's always referred to as the. Freedom Now Suite, so, but, but the official title says, we insist, exclamation point, Freedom Now Suite. So when you initially interviewed Max about this, what was his take all these years later? What was his, um, his description of what he was trying to do, his explanation? Well, I think he was very proud of it. It was interesting, he seemed to feel nostalgic about Abby Lincoln. Mm. When I spoke with him, um, he was doing, he was working with Baraka on his, his autobiography at the time, and he was a little bit evasive in terms of giving me lots of detail. But I went and I told him that I'd talked with Oscar Brown, and he said that, you know, they had this, you know, disagreement about, you know, the politics of the time, and that Oscar Brown was more moderate and, Max was moving in a more um, nationalist kind of direction and pan-Africanist direction. And he basically said, oh, yeah, we, you know, that was a lot. You know, he was not giving me a lot of detail about it in my own interview with him. He kind of said, well, you know, I'm working on this autobiography. I can only say. He's saving it for the book. So, so much. And, of course, they didn't finish the autobiography. Um, but, we ha but here in the archive, are the interviews that they did in around 1995 and some drafts that they were working on. So I'm, that's another thing that I'm taking a, a when look it, at When here. Ingrid talks about Baraka, she's referring to Amiri Baraka. Amiri Baraka. With whom they were collaborating on an autobiography, or yes, on an autobiography. So if, uh, and I, I may end up asking you this question again in another week mm -hmm. or two. If Max were here with us today, what would you like to ask him? these years later? You know, uh, uh, these years later, one of the things that's overwhelmed me the, uh, the last couple of days is I've gone through a number of his business papers. And it's very clear to me that he was deeply involved in the running of his own affairs, um, ha had very clear conceptions of his works. So, you know, and. In the, in the archive are these um, yellow notepads where he's written these elaborate letters in longhand in pencil. And that later, it, and before they're sent, then he's given them to somebody to type up. So then there's a type version of it too. But he goes back and corrects things. Um, and 
he was right on top of the details of how he was going to be represented in um, pamphlets and things that publicizing his appearances. Um, very involved in fine-tuning contractual issues. Um, and I think he worked very hard to get paid for paid what he thought he was worth. And so he was, it's clear that he was a tough negotiator um, with these things. But there are also drafts in there of plays that I think he wrote, or, or play like, he, you know, multimedia kinds of um, projects in which he very carefully s sketches out the drafts, writes a rationale for it, what his overarching artistic goals are. So you see, an, you see an artist at work, and you realize that one thing that an artist like him does is has a vision and works extremely hard to make it happen. So there he is, you know, the lo logistics of all the instruments that uh, that need to be hired, the, the scoring, the staging, the lighting. Um, he. he I, I would simply want to ask him more about this and how he moved from the administrative side of his career to his, the creative side and back. But he was not hands off at all. Hmm. We, we can say he that. was a disciplined person. Very, very. Would you say controlling? Well, I didn't know him well personally to say that, um, but. I, Yes, he probably there is, was. There is evidence. When of that. you're artistically committed and you want things a certain way, you're going to push until you get what you want, kind mm -hmm. of. And I, 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 so I see that uh, that sign there. But we'd have to ask his family. I mean, I have a certain impression from interviewing Abby Lincoln, who I think found him very controlling. The vision of the work that comes from both Max and Abby. Were they in sync, or did they have differing ideas of what they were trying to do? It was interesting. When I interviewed Abby Lincoln for my book, she invited me to her apartment, and we talked for three hours. And I arrived <clears throat> ready to take down the story of the revolutionary heroine. That's the story I thought I was, would be getting. Maybe, maybe we should just, for, for those who may be watching this webcast, yes. just talk a little bit about who Abby Lincoln was Abby and the context. Abby Lincoln was a fabulous singer and was married to Max Roach um, during the 60s. They, 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 she was involved with him from the you know, late 1950s, and then they were divorced in 1970. But it's clear that she was really his deepest muse, it seems to me. Um, and when I interviewed her, she wanted to distance herself from all of that. She kind of said, well, Max made me do that. Max made me do the screaming. Um, it, you know, that wasn't my idea. And it was really hard to sing against those arrangements. Um, and... She was also an actress. She was also an actress. And, and she later in what 1964 does nothing but a man this film nothing but a man if you've never seen it she's amazing in it and then for the love of ivy mm. um but i think the thing to remember about the two of them is the speaking out had a price so if you look at their recordings in the 1960s abby lincoln didn't do another recording on under her own name after straight ahead and, until the 1970s and uh, Max had, had more recordings, but he wasn't, he wasn't lionized in the 1960s. And do you attribute this to the price that they paid in commercial I terms? I think they were coded as difficult. They were coded as difficult. And so some people simply didn't want to deal with them. So, and that's how the music industry froze out outspoken artists. Oh, so and so is difficult, and um, you know Abby Lincoln. When I spoke to her, talked to, you know about coming into her own in the '80s and her writing her own songs and her own artistic musical vision, and 
viewed her old self in the early 1960s is when she was trying to please Max Roach. As an actor or actress tries to please a director. And as a wife often tries to please a husband. There are some um, intimate, very personal bits of correspondence between them. Of course, in the Max Roach collection, we have the things that Abby wrote to Max. We don't necessarily have the things that Max wrote to Abby, although those may be at the Institute for Jazz Studies where the Abby Lincoln papers reside. So are you planning to go visit <coughs> IJS to of see those course. papers? Absolutely. The I other see side the, of the, the coin? See the other side of the coin and um, Yes, it's complicated. But when I, you know, to go back to when I interviewed Max, in the middle of this, I was showing him the magazine copy of the racial prejudice in jazz interview, and it has this picture of Abby Lincoln who was just glaring at Ira Gittler. And the jazz <laughs> and critic. Yeah. The jazz critic. And um, Max looked at that picture and he. He laughed and he kind of said, "Oh, she was really something, you know. You know, she, you know, was, you know, look at Abby, ha ha ha. You know, she was really something." So there was this admiration and sort of nostalgia. And I interviewed Ira Gittler too. I wanted to give him the chance to take back everything that he said. In so that so what, did, what did Ira say, or what did you Ira, ask him specifically? Ira didn't take anything back. I was I was disappointed that he didn't take anything back, but. You know, he knew them. They had a longer history with him. And I think one of the things we need to remember about how when things got incendiary around race in the 1960s, just as, you know, maybe now things get, are, are getting in, incendiary, is people will say these horrible things about one another in a public event. Um, you know, and they, but they invited Ira to their wedding, which happened afterwards. So. They had a longer history of, with one another in terms of interacting within the, the New York Jazz world. Dan Marcus and Stern told me the same thing one time. He said he, he, he was on some panel in 1970 or 71, and he was like the only white person representing kind of downbeat. And there was a whole discussion of, about jazz and exploitation, and he, you know, Max was there, and, it, you know, and he sort of got called out. And then Dan said, well, when it was over, Max came up to me and said, um, you know, Dan, it's not personal. You know, you know, you have to remember it's not personal. And, you know, can you give me a ride to the Upper West Side? And so they got in the car together and went off and were talking, but they, they had a longer relationship than, than the public event. And I think that that was true for a number of people. So if it's not personal, what is it really? Is, there, is it just discourse? What is it? Well, now we're getting into my book, which is, you know, <laughs> I, how I coped with trying to tell the, tell the story and to try to develop some kind of framework for talking about hard, hard interracial conversations was to say on one level there's discourse, there's rhetoric. People say all sorts of things. There's what people say. And then there's practice, it's what people do. And, um, and then underline it all is kind of a structural situation, the economics of the music business and the long, long durée of structural racism in the, in the music industry. So yes, the, the discourse could get really, really polarized. And at the same time, people went on and they had their ongoing interracial collaborations with various people. Um, you know, think of Archie Shep. So Archie Shep was also somebody who had a lot of, you know, strong discourse around 1965 or so. There was a certain pressure on musicians um, who wanted to show that they were conscious and um, self-determining um, to not have to not have so many white people in the band. You know, there was a certain pressure. So in the middle of all this, Archie Shep's got Roswell Rudd in the band. And was, Roswell was with him the entire time. It was sort of like, OK, I, I may be making general statements about the nature of, race, 
uh, race relations, but Roswell's okay with me. You know, and I, so I think that there were a lot of like individual personal relationships that cut, cut across some of the um, difficult conversations. And I think for the white people who were part of those conversations, they learned something. They got better. So when Max says it's not personal, but then you see the photograph of Abby glaring at Ira, <laughs> was it personal for Abby? Or was that just her being an actress? No, she was really, you know, it was caught at a moment that Ira had some, said something to her that was really made her mad. And she did not um, spend much time with him, but, that, but she also told me a story of running into Ira in a bar like 20 years later and having a converse, you know, kind of conversation. I don't think she, I think Max sounded more forgiving to Ira than Abby, Abby did, but, but she also met him 20 years later and you know, they, they knew one another. Mm -hmm. Now we've been talking about Max Roach a lot because that's been the focus of your time so far. Yes. But are there other collections you are particularly interested in and uh, what do you hope to find in those collections? Well, thanks to you, you've been showing me these gems from all sorts of collections. I feel like I could stay here for six months. You know? I wish and, you would. <laughs> and uh, there's so many wonderful things. You were telling me about Bruce Lundvall's collection. I'm very interested in the economic picture. We, um, you know, probably where the, you know, there's a lot of talk about unfair record deals and stuff. And, it, and it's very difficult to get hard economic information except from musicians who kept their contracts. And Max Roach has done this. And evidently Bruce Lundvall, there's all sorts of, so you can find out what people got paid, what the terms of their contracts were. So you have a better idea of, um, you know, the, the, the economic picture for mu musicians at the, at the time. So I'm very excited at looking at those materials. I'm interested in copyright issues also. Um, so I want to make a trip to the copyright division. I'm interested in the whole problem of what was used as a copyright deposit before 1978 when it had to be a, a written deposit. Um, and I learned a lot about this because I was an expert witness for, on the Marvin Gaye side of the case in the blurred lines thing. And it was all about the other side trying to say that the extent of the comp composition was only what was notated in the lead sheet. There's a way in which copy, so th this idea of um, the popular song being simply a melody and chords and the words, it descends from the fact that that, you know, lead sheets became the, you know, the standard copyright deposit for people who were trying to, you know, often were making music either orally or, or only partially with notation. So, but, but what made those two songs popular was not the chords or the melody, it was the groove. Exactly. Amen. And, and how do so you document one of my, the groove? Okay, here's the thing is, it's so, so there's this idea that they, you know, with copyright, in, if, if the lychee just had the melody and the chords, it was all, you know, people would say, oh, the rest is just arrangement, as if, Anything that's played by the bass, drums, and piano is generic. Okay, this, 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 here's this whole idea of what is generic. And I, and I think, well, you know, if grooves are just gener generic, how come they change all the time? And you can, you know, in the way I teach, you can really almost do a, a complete history of different styles of music based on the changes in the grooves. So somebody was inventing those together. and. If they became popular, then other people started imitating them, and then they became generic. But but creating a groove is a composition, in my view, is a is a compositional act, and that's what I argued in the Marvin Gaye case: is that the particular set of parts that were going on, he was play, playing them all on that recording, was not something that was generic and was pre previously seen. So, but, but can one register? for copyright, a groove? No, as far as I know, you can't. Yeah. So there's a way in which um, the copyright has not served this kind of music well. And you say you worked on that or you were consulted 
for that case, what exactly did you do? Did you testify? And if so, what I did, did you? I did. Yes. What, what was your point of view? Is it what you were just suggesting? Right. I worked. Uh, it was me and uh, another musicologist named Judith Finnell, and we started out first by just transcribing and comparing and finding. You by know, the way, how did they find you? I mean, how did you get tapped? I'm not for that? sure how they found me. Somebody told them to call me. Uh huh. And and they and so I talked to them and I, I had heard the pieces and I, I agreed you know with their side of the case. Um, By the way, what was their side of it? The, you agreed that what? That 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 blurred lines ripped off from got to give it up. Okay. Does everybody know those songs? I mean, those are okay. <laughs> so I, I I know Marvin Gaye did the original. Who did the copy? Who did the second? Robin Thicke and Pharrell. There we go. Two big names. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. But we, we shouldn't uh, get delayed on that. But so the, to have the, to be able to look at the copyright deposits and, and just get a sense of what some of the jazz people put in for their copyright deposits, probably some people put in more elaborate scores than others. Um, so that I'm interested in the economic and the legal questions. And then just, you know, you open these files, and y you may think that some collection might not have anything relevant to you, and then you start looking at what's in there. Um, and, you, and you get a new view of the person. You know, I feel like I've gotten a new view of Max Roach by looking at these papers. On the, on the one hand, you feel like you're, you're digging in somebody's personal materials. These things were in his house. Um, and so you feel a little bit like a voyeur, voyeur, and that you need, you know, need to have some care with with how you're looking at this. Um, and it's a treasure to fill in the the kinds of details that that you see uh, from what people saved and organized. But seeing his handwriting, it just, you know, it just. It gives you a very personal feel of this man engaged in his career. I mean, he was serious, very serious. So when you write about any of these artists, any of these musicians, do you feel an obligation or responsibility to their legacy? I mean, we know that people have certain mythologies about Max Roach. They don't want to hear the rough edges or the warts. They don't want to read that stuff. So I'm wondering, do you approach this as a historian, as a musicologist? How do you tell the story, be true to the story, but to what extent are you concerned with um, the legacy of, in this case, Max Roach or Charles Mingus? Well, it's, I think this is really the challenge of doing biographies. I haven't done a biography of a jazz musician. I, Freedom Sounds was not a biography, and part of the reason was is I wanted to tell a broad history, and I wanted it to not be just the story of one musician, but more of a portrait of a kind of conversation that took place across a broader community. And I wrote in that book that, that I really fight against the tendency to make everybody a genius and to say only glowing things about them because I don't think that serves their legacy, actually. Because the nitty gritty of the story is all the things they had to do to be who they are. And what you see in this Max Roach archive is the tremendous amount of work put, in, put into conceptualizing and handling business and conceiving work. So I want people to understand what people had to go through. Unfortunately, with the, when the narrative becomes too much one of genius, people sit back and, and sort of think, well, it was just handed to them. It was preordained. They were talented and you know, in the right place at the right time, and, and they became legendary. And I think there's a much more important story with all of these musicians about a process of self-making. And that music, pl playing music itself is an act of self-making. It takes practice and discipline. 
organizing a successful performance career also takes a kind of discipline and hardiness that, um, that is lost when all people do is focus, you know, you know, in some earlier jazz histories, all they did was focus on Charlie Parker high on heroin or um, some outrageous thing Charles Mingus said when he went to a restaurant and intimidated <laughs> the owner. Um, and all of those are colorful. You don't want to, you, you don't want to leave those details out. Um, but people can really, mm, you know, make a fetish of some of the war stories. And those, that's only one part of the story. Yes. And so, what are the other parts of this story, <laughs> aside from the struggle that everybody, I mean, everybody struggles with something, right. especially creative artists. So what else is there? If it's not genius, if it's not struggle, if it's not pathology, where does this creativity come from, do you think? Uh, you'd like a like psychoanalytic? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'd like some kind of answer or speculation. Well, I, I feel about people who, that people are, who are arti really artistically creative and especially composers in creating new works, they need to do it. There's a, there's a compulsion to do it. You're driven to do it. You like the process of doing it. You like the re result of it. And you need to do it to, to feel OK. Hmm. Um, and I think d what's driving that interest for somebody, I think, varies from musicians to mus uh, musicians. I think some of the issues are part of your historical time. Some are about the personal struggles you're going to. I mean. You know, in addition to dealing with your career and practicing and, you know, everything, people have personal lives and families and cousins and um, health problems and uh, that are part of just you know, the whole human mix that everybody uh, has to contend with. Indeed. So. When you are teaching your classes, and I'm, I'm guessing, first of all, tell us a little bit about what specific courses you do teach, mm -hmm. and then what your students, what your experience has been with your students as far as what they want to learn, or what they expect to learn, or what their mythologies might be. I do, I've done, two large lecture courses. One is called Jazz, Freedom, and Culture. And the other is called From R&B to Neo Soul, which is more about R&B and, and popular music. Um, and they have counted for general education at Harvard. And so they tend to be the kind of classes where I get a couple hundred students in them or a hundred students in them. And I've taught some version of these courses throughout my career. And what I learn in teaching it anew, I never do it the same way twice because I feel like the, your, your challenge is to communicate with the students in front of you. And their viewpoints on stuff have changed. Um, they, they come with different pre-existing narratives about jazz or about Motown. Can you give some examples of these narratives? Well, like, uh, for, you know, the genius narrative in jazz, and we start with Louis Armstrong, and, and we want to hear all the geniuses. We're not interested in <laughs> people that we don't already know are important. Okay, kind of, it's so just the great, one kind of thing. So the great man approach. There, there is a kind of great man kind of thing um, that people have. And then they think they understand about the politics of it. They think, well, there was the civil rights movement and there was black power and nothing has happened since. Okay. Well, this has changed since black lives matter, um, emerged into the spotlight a couple years ago. Um, and I found, I found as the students got younger, they, they had a very sanitized vision of the history of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. that, I don't know, they got watching a documentary or something. And, um, you know, and I have, I, I try to show them documents and things to, 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 and materials that I know will give them a more nuanced 
figure because because the, the the part I couldn't stand was when um, there's there's such a romance about black power which is incredibly important but I make an argument in my book that self determination is people wanted whether they supported Malcolm X or Martin Luther King everybody wanted self determination and I quote Bernice Regan about you know look marching nonviolently in your town was an act of war in the South in 1960 or 1961 or 1962. So I try to show the commitment and the bravery on, on you know, on from, from different regions of, of, of the movement in there and not have them just say, well, I'm, because you, you find some of the students come, come in and they're only interested in black power and everything else is some kind of compromise and I, and that's not, I don't think that's a full story, and I want them to—I want them to have the tools to, you know, um, think about that. And you know, I do a similar thing in in terms of talking about popular music, and I try to give them as much much information as um, as is available to me for for them to think about um, the importance. A popular music, who identifies with it? You know, there's always the issues of appropriation, exploitation. What is what? What are ethical relationships to black music if you aren't black? Um, and the idea that. It, the other thing I say is like, you know, this music is something. It's not, you know, when I say I teach a popular course to some of my colleagues, oh, popular music, that must just be an easy A for everybody. Um, and I really feel like the issues raised by the history of African American music in terms of American race relations are as deep and complex and profound as you could, you could teach in any course. And I try to get my students to feel more comfortable talking about it, writing about it, reading about it. Um, and some people are resistant, and some people totally embrace it. And and I just use myself as a lightning rod for ambivalence. Sometimes I go, look, I'm the white Quincy Jones professor of African American music. You can ask me any question you want about that. And um, so we get into. You know, and everybody talks about their own relationship to these things. And we are, in just a moment or two, we're going to give you a chance to ask any question you want about that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to ask a kind of naive question, mm -hmm. sort of open-ended. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, because I, I know your study has not just been in jazz and popular music, you have a deep and abiding interest in African music. Yes, okay. I do, and in fact, I'm finishing a book right now about a musician from Mali. I, you know, I'm trained as an ethnomusicologist, and I, I really wanted to do a project in Africa. First of all, if you love jazz, you, it's very easy to fall in love with music from Mali. You like instrumental improvisation, um, socially engaged topics. Mali is fantastic, um, but. It, also, I could see my students being curious about the relationship to a, what it means to identify with an African diaspora and the complexity of what that history is. And so I felt like I wanted to know at least one music on the African content from that point of view. And so I, 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 I've spent time in Mali. I'm, the musician I'm writing about is a guy named Neva Solo who plays um, a pentatonic balafon. He's sinufo, um, and his music is really, really interesting. I sort of, to my to jazz fans, I say he's kind of like the Charlie Parker and the John Coltrane of the sinufo balafon. He he took it and he had a, an imagination for modernizing the village tradition that he was raised with, and it's amazing. Well, this leads to my naive yeah. question, which is, um, what do you really feel is African about African-American music? 
Well, this is a long question, and people have answered it in, in all sorts of ways, but I approach it by trying to look at the history of the slave trade here and where people came from. There's been this fluorescence of work on the 18th and 19th century in African American history that I think has been really important. And one of the things that it's shown is that one of the early layers of um, where people came from was what was then called Senegambia or Senegal, Mali area. And people were in New Orleans, there were balafons, the wooden xylophones, um, and uh, other parts of the continent then later were from Congo, Angola. So I want to look deeply historically about it. And one of the, th my bees in my bonnet when I talk about African music is that you cannot, j you know, I, I, sometimes I say to my students, well, you're not going to be leaving this course saying that the African part of the music is the rhythm only. Okay. That's the cliche. This music has melody. Uh, the drum parts have melody. In fact, you can't play these um, complex polyrhythms unless the drums are tuned to different pitch levels because they would all blend it. And I, I, there's a Nigerian music theorist named Meki Nzewe who, who talks about mellow rhythm as being the shape of the, the drum parts in the drum ensembles. And you know some of the early recording of drum ensembles didn't didn't include the people who were singing. Okay, so you get this idea that people just played drums alone all the time when when most of the time they're singing and often a, often a ritual purpose, um, and then there are instruments in Mali that are, have harmony, pentatonic harmony. The the uh, Mande jelly tradition has. Uh, Heptatonic seven seven note scale, and they have harmony, you know, harmonies and tunings. The the Zimbabwe uh, embiras um, have fantastic uh, tuning and compositional, you know, har harmony qualities to it. So I want people to understand the music is just like is comprised of all the musical um, variables that include melody, rhythm, harmony timbre, and in many African musics, um, since people speak tone languages, you can literally play words in an in instrumental fashion. Um, so, so when you listen to popular music today, or jazz for that matter, or anything, can you identify from listening what is the African element? Well, I often put up on the board um, Ollie Wilson's heterogeneous sound ideal that he wrote, I believe, in the 80s or early 90s. And he had this wonderful point of view of trying to identify what things were in common throughout African diasporic music. And part of it had to do with, uh, I won't be able to recall his language, uh, about the nature of grooves, hmm. about call and response, about a preference for a dense texture and different timbres, not a homogeneous timbre, but heterogeneous timbre. Um, layers of riffs and repeating elements at different architectonic levels. You know, and I often teach, I love teaching Count Basie that way. You think it's just a riff, but I, you know, let me play a volcano and show you um, how these are organized and layered, uh, layered together. So, one of the things I really feel strongly about this is repetition is not a bad word. Um, so there, so I would I I tend to rely on this this call and response multi lever layered ensemble and these interacting lines can be rhythmic they can be melodic, and you and I, you hear it all over you know so grooves grooves are really important in this. Indeed, in life actually <laughs> not just in music. Um, now's the time when we can open it up for any questions that you might have. And Mike has a microphone <laughs> that he can wander. Much. And uh, I think David has a question up, up towards the front. I'm very interested to know, <clears throat> uh, in regards to the recording made for Nat Hentoff's Candid label, how, was, how were the funds 
raised for that? Who paid for that recording? I would have to go back into my interview with Nat Hentoff on that, but somebody who was a friend of Nat Hentoff funded him for that year. And I'd, I, it was somebody who had the money, but I don't know who it was. I, I have it in my notes. I'd, I'd have to read that, but that's a very good, you know, that's a good question. But Nat talked about it as, you know, you know, look, I was really lucky this guy, you know, let me do whatever I wanted. Nat was not the owner of Candid. He was the A&R person for that period yes. of time. Yes, yes. Do you know who the owner was? I do, but his name has slipped out of my head. I have it on my desk, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, James. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about Max Roach, uh, this goes back to the African music thing. Uh, you, you mentioned Olatunji, and he seems like, to somebody like myself who doesn't know a lot about African music, he seems like this kind of towering figure for the United States and its relationship to African music, as if this Drums of Passion album was put yes. out and then suddenly everyone knew about African music somehow by this mm -hmm. one record, and that was sort of a catalyst for jazz and popular music and Bob Dylan to mention him in songs and all that sort of thing. And I was wondering if you could um, just say a little bit about um, Olatunji's influence on American popular music um, at that time, and also if, for someone like myself who's basically otherwise ignorant of this situation, if there were other African performers who were making that kind of influence that maybe don't have the name recognition now? Well, it's, it's interesting because Olatunji, that record, Drums of Passion, you know, went huge. But there was a community of people um, that were involved in either African or Afro-Cuban music. And Max Roach and Charlie Parker talk about their, you know, going back into the 40s, there was, you know, an African academy of something that's meant that Dizzy Gillespie talks about where they went and they heard, heard people who were playing Latin music of various kinds. You get Art Blakey in like the early 1950s working with Sabu Martinez. And clearly some Afro-Cuban musicians were involved in Santeria. So he does orgy and rhythm. Um, there's this piece called Dinga, which is, you know, really inclu includes a chant to a legua in it. Um, Sabu Martinez, Can Candido Camaro, 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 Camaro. Yeah. I always get that wrong. Randy Weston talked about Montego Joe. Um, there, there was a whole community uh, around this that were exchanging the ideas. And the, you know, look at the percussion section on Uhuru Africa, and then Freedom Now had, you know, had this contingent of Latin <coughs> players on on the Freedom Now suite. And did we mention Chano Pozo? Oh, with, we forgot Chano Pozo. With Dizzy That's Gillespie. That's unforgivable. With, with, with Chano Pozo was huge in the, in the 40s and Cubana B, Cubana Bob. Um, Machito uh, did a number of things with, um, you know, that crossed, you know, so there was interest among musicians in all of this. And the Palladium was really popular in the 50s, and jazz people used to go, go to that, you know, and, and listen to it too. So I, I you know, there, People listen to, we're listening to each other earlier than one might anticipate. Because I remember when I started the research on this, I thought, well, the, the kind of on the ground line uh, that most people were saying was, oh yeah, the African stuff came in the 60s. And that's really wrong. Uh, and uh, Randy, Randy Weston talked about how in the Brooklyn he grew up in, um, there were a lot of Garveyites, Mark, you know, and people from the Caribbean, who were deeply involved in many of these things. And then Robin Kelly gave me this amazing thing from like 1958, Abdul Rahman, I'm, I'm not gonna get it quite correctly, but, it was, but there was like a little African cultural center in Brooklyn. There was also a bassist yes. named uh, Ahmed Abdul Malik. Yes. Who, who had played with Monk, yes. and he had played with a number of others, and. Yeah, there's all kinds of things happening. I guess one follow-up to that um, question is, to what extent 
were these mm, integrated fully versus just exoticizing what people were already doing? You know, this stuff becomes a, a judgment call because, you know, often Babatunde Olatunji got crit, uh, critiqued in Nigeria for, you know, not really knowing the tradition to the level he should have in order to be performing this stuff. So he went back to Nigeria and, and his ancestors and relatives gave him a very hard time. So, because, you know, people, people are very fussy about their own culture. And of course, you had an American audience uh, where, you know, white people have long been fascinated with things African and exotic and wild rhythms. And it's, you know, so, so the way in which it was marketed seemed to feed right into that. And so you get people, but you get people in the 60s who are trying to seriously study Africa, um, Yoruba culture, Mande culture, um, to really know about religion, and you get, you know, you get cultural na nationalism, and people are really trying to look at, at at a basis for an African socialism. They're looking at Julius Nyerere. Um, The US organization, Malana Karenga, who then develops then Kwanzaa. And they're really, you know, trying to make some serious study of not only African music, but the culture and religion and values that they saw underlying it. And of course, in the culture, it's more than just Africa. I mean, we can see an analog with fascination with India, for example. Oh, yeah. The other case. The other. <laughs> okay. OK. Who else has a question? There you go. Thank you. Thank both of you. Um, you kind of started with and come back several times to the question of uh, appropriateness, cross race, and appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in this for a while now. A long time. How has, how has both uh, the ways you have been confronted about being a white person dealing with this and the ways that you have developed your rationale and response to that, how has that changed over time? Well, it's interesting because if you'd asked me when I was in graduate school, if you'd, say, you'd said to me I was going to end up at Harvard University as the Quincy Jones professor, I would have just laughed. My, I thought, OK, I was good in school, so I should be able to get some kind of job. Um, but the surprise has been, I decided that I w wanted to work on jazz. And I knew from having been in the jazz world and having African American mentors and friends, and there were la I'd like to mention that Richard Davis was extremely important to me at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I learned a lot from Richard Davis. I learned a lot from working with Don Byron in the uh, 1980s. And we were always talking about these issues. So there was no way when I went to graduate school that I was going to shove this issue under the rug. I knew it needed to be dealt with. And so I tried to, I chose ethnomusicology because I wanted to do something from a musician's point of view. So my per first book is about the rhythm section from the musician's point of view. And I interviewed all these rhythm section players, which was really fun. And I took drum lessons for a year, because I um, that was the only instrument I felt like I was totally lost. Uh, and I needed to under understand more. And I loved doing this. And people had the most amazing things to say. And I had a good time you know, trying to craft things that I felt honored uh, their, their point of view. Um, mostly. When I came into the field of ethnomusicology as a professor in the early 1990s, my African American colleagues were glad I was saying what I was saying, because it, w it didn't have to be just them bringing up race over and over. Um, and they were more supportive to me than I, I, I would have thought they should have been. 
um, I, gave, I gave a talk. Then I started to you know, call out in some of my work, I have called out certain problems of white liberalism. Okay, so I wrote an article that was called The Problem with White Hipness that was in the Journal of the American Musicological Society in about 1995. And when I was preparing that piece, I presented it at a conference. And I presented it, and the first person to jump up was Portia Maltzby from Indiana University, uh, African-American scholar of African-American music who um, is now retired from Indiana University. And I thought, like, well, I'm either in trouble or <laughs> I wasn't sure. I thought I was probably in trouble. And she, she got and she said, everything she said was true, <laughs> you know, kind of, because I was calling. To, so I felt like people um, had some appreciation uh, for what I was trying to do and felt that I was a voice in the field and that I consistently within the field advocated for opening the doors for more scholarship on African American music and more African American um, graduate students then becoming professors. Um, students, I, uh, before I was hired at Harvard, they asked me to come and be a visiting professor in 1999. And I came, and I was, I was in, in the middle of writing um, Freedom Sounds. And so I did a little seminar with um, our students on jazz and the civil rights movement. And it was a predominantly African-American class. And we just had the most lively conversation, which included one of the, you know, one of the students coming to me, what are you doing as a white person, you know, teaching this? And, um, you know, and, you know, I remember writing on the board one, black power, what is it? How are you going to get it? You know, kind of. And really having a, a discussion about it. And we had lively conversations. And anytime in, in a class where I feel like the students get to know me, I feel we can try to find common ground. Um, but that doesn't mean everybody's happy. So I, I, I gave a talk one other time. I, was, I happened to be on a panel that had all white people on it, and I was talking about black music. And an Af African-American scholar who I didn't know at the time got up and started saying, I don't know, you know, I was talking about Miles Davis and John Coltrane. You didn't mention that they were African American, you know. And I, I thought I was speaking to an audience that, you, you, you know, and um, kind of went off on me. And so I said, "Well, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't represent." You know, I, I've always taken a humble thing, like I'm sorry I didn't meet your expectations. <laughs> um, and the next thing I knew, Melanie Burnham from Indiana University was standing up and saying, "Well, we appreciate what she does." You know, so I, you know, I have, I've got, I've, I've had both things. I've had, you know, so I've, I think it's a completely normal reaction to be totally suspicious. And lately, um, my student, you know, so the last time I taught my R&B to Neo Soul class, I started out my, my first lecture saying, you know, some of you might be wondering how I got to be the Quincy Jones Professor of African American Music. And I explained that I was hired by an African American Studies department that included <coughs> a lot of African Americans. And, um, and I said, but nevertheless, you know, at this point in time, it's feeling kind of awkward being up here performing white authority, <laughs> you know, okay, the white, being the white talking head. And I said, um, in, this, in this opening thing, I said, well, I want to assure you that I'm no Rachel Dolezal. Okay, I, I don't remember, you know, okay, she's the one, and they cracked up, you know, she was the one who pretended to be black and claimed she was black, okay. Um, and I said, I, you know, I know I'm white, and that's a particular positionality, and I think all of us, you know, and I try to take account of that positionality, and we will have conversations uh, based on that. And, you know, I went over some. I think some people still, you know, would rather have it taught by an African-American faculty member at, at, the, at this point in time. And I sort of think, well, I'll, you know, I'm not that far from retirement, you know, kind of. But, um, um, but I, also, I also want my students to think that we, we need all points of view on this. And I think 
African American music infuses our entire culture. And when studied properly, I think it gives you an incredible ethics lesson on the history of race in America on issues of things people say in stupid ways um, uh, about dancing and partying and, and their, their stereotypes. And things come up in our conversations in the sections of this course in which people put each other on the spot. And that, that spot of being put on the spot for it and, and accounting for your point of view I think helps people grow. It's not, it's not a thing to be avoided. I feel like I'm so happy that I've been confronted on, on um, all sorts of things because I, I feel like uh, studying this stuff has you know, in, you know, enriched me. It's made me a better person by sort of suddenly going, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And um, the next time this happens, I will think of it that way. That's a, that's how that's a, well. We have time for one more. Go ahead. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, Mass Roach and uh, uh, the Jazz Messenger. But anyway, you know, well, we as a people was well familiar with drums. You know, we used to hear in Africa, our ancestors had what you call the talking drum, the communication. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we was being from you know what's it, uh, uh, Art Blakely. He went to Africa, and he stayed over there for quite a while to learn some of the rhythm of the ancestors. So I agree with that. Well, I actually wrote about Art Blakey and his trip to Ghana, uh, which was in about 1947. And um, he claimed in his interviews that he didn't go to study the drums, but I can't believe he didn't play the drums while he was. Um, and he said he was interested in religion. <coughs> but I think saying that he was interested in religion was another way to say he was also interested in the drums. And um, so I was fascinated with Art Blakey. I was fascinated that in 1953 he did a record um, with Sabu Martinez, and he called it Message from Kenya. And it was right at the time of the Mau Mau stuff going on in Kenya, where the British were killing people and suppressing um, uh, Mau Mau resistance to uh, colonial rule. In 19, right at the time of the independence of Ghana, in 1957, he does what is it, orgy and rhythm. It was like, it was like right at the time. And, and the independence of Ghana was widely covered in African American newspapers at the time. So I really viewed Art Blakey as being really, uh, really, you know, ahead of, you know, in terms of thinking about the role of the drum and the many things you could, you could do with it. So then I was baffled later in 1970, he gives an interview and he says, our music has nothing to do with Africa. And I asked Randy Weston about that. <coughs> and Randy kind of said, it's in, the, you know, it's in the music. Don't pay any attention to what he <laughs> said about it. You can, hear it in the, you can hear it in the music. So yeah, I think people were deeply interested in trying to learn as much as they could. Which, and it was harder to do that then. Did we have any last questions? If not, I want to um, close and ask one quickie. You're giving a talk here next week. What will I the am. subject of that lecture be? It is called um, Miles Davis and John Coltrane as Living Ancestors. And I'm going to talk about relationship to African stuff in there. So that will be next Thursday? Is yes. That, yeah. mm -hmm. We invite you all to join us for that. For now, please help me thank Ingrid Monson. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.